I've shown you the financial statements now. Let's look at some journal entries for hospitals. So let's take a situation where patient services were provided, and this is you know for a whole year, and this is how you would get kind of the financial statements that we saw before. So some of these numbers might look a little familiar to you. Um, patient services were delivered that had retail value of $2.6 million and then deductions for contractual adjustments were 240000 I have to tell you that contractual adjustments are usually a lot more than 10% of gross patient services. So the way that you would book this is you would actually book it gross and you debit accounts receivable because you need to keep track of the gross value here. So accounts receivable would be debited for $2.6 million credit patient services revenue. And obviously this means this is initially recorded gross. And then you would debit. Now they're just in the book, they're just debiting patient services revenue. You would really have a separate account for this for the contractual adjustments within patient service revenue. So you'd have patient service revenue gross, and then you would have different reasons for deductions against it. One of them would be contractual adjustments, and there would be all sorts of other ones. There'd be charity care and things like that. And credit accounts via revenue, accounts receivable, in order to adjust for the contractual adjustments. And then we get a little more money too. We get 20,000 from the cafeteria, 4,000 from the gift shop, and 6,000 from vending machine commissions. So I'm getting a total of $30,000, and I'm going to credit revenue from cafeteria sales for $20,000, and I'm going to credit revenue from gift shop sales for $1,000. And then revenue from vending machine commissions. The way vending machines usually work is that you get commissions on whatever is sold, but the vending machines are actually run by an outside company. Scene Hall does the same thing, by the way. Hospital incurs nursing expense, various operating expenses. These are the costs of running the hospital. So we've got you can remember this. I don't know if you're printing this out or you're just watching the video while you're sitting on the train. Whatever you're doing, these are the various items I'm going to work with. And notice that the total cash paid was $21.25. And let's just go through these one by one. So I've got nursing services revenue, nursing services expense rather, of $800,000. I've got other professional services expense of 620. I've got general services expense of $700,000. I've got fiscal services expense of $100,000. I've got administrative services expense. of $80,000. That would be the people who do the paperwork, the accountants. Medical malpractice costs of $30,000. Bad debt expense. I did a research project on bad debt expense for hospitals, looking at bad debt expense in charity care. Hospitals are required to provide a certain amount of charity care. So if a poor person walks into the hospital and says, I need brain surgery, but I don't have any money, the hospital is supposed to help them and determine if they're entitled to what's called charity care. And if it's a not-for-profit hospital in most states, then um, they're really required to do it for whatever, to make an assessment of what the person can afford, and then provide them that service. And you know, reduce the price by whatever they need to reduce it by. Um, and it makes sense because a not-for-profit hospital, right, is receiving government benefits. They might not be paying any property taxes. They don't have to pay any income taxes, things like that. And that means they're supposed to be providing a service. And they're not just a business to deliver health care. 
they are supposed to benefit the community in other ways. It's not just a business that's supposed to make money for their shareholders. In fact, there are no shareholders. There shouldn't be. Credit allowance for uncollectibles. This is related to the bad debt. I don't know why they do this as one entry, but it's $60,000. Um, they've also got, they used inventories of 90000 And they used prepaid expenses up, like in prepaid insurance and stuff, of 5000 They also um, increased their payables. In other words, they, they paid twenty one twenty five for all of this, but there's some bills they didn't pay, so they went into accounts payable. This is sort of an aggregate entry that's designed to summarize everything that happened during the period. And they have accrued expenses payable. I'll just, I always like to write payable in there, $30,000. And I must be mi missing this from my notes, but um, it also says here estimated malpractice cost payable. I guess that's in the book. It's supposed to be $30,000. And let's just make sure we got this right. You can see I'm missing something. And I'm missing accumulated depreciation. Because I debited depreciation expense. So I'd also have accumulated depreciation of $200,000. Oh, this here estimated malpractice cost payable is this. In other words, they had an estimate of $30,000, which they accrued. So they're going to debit medical malpractice costs as an expense and credit estimated malpractice costs payable $30,000. And that would be under FASB Statement 5. It's a contingent liability. Okay, they received donated services of $10,000. Remember the deal with donated services, right? With donated services, the way the accounting is going to work is that Contributions of service are recognized as revenue with an equivalent amount recorded as an expenditures if they create or enhance non-financial assets or they require specialized skills. They're provided by individuals who process those, possess those skills and they typically need to be purchased if not donated. Remember that. So here we receive donated services and you're probably like, well, what are you going to debit? Right? You're going to credit donated services, which is a revenue, but what do you debit? And the debit is, it's an expense because you used it. So other, this is a doctor or maybe it's a therapist, I don't know, other professional services expense, $10,000, it's an expense. It's a revenue, it's very unusual by the way, you would record a revenue and an expense in a single transaction like that. I, I can't think of another example where you would just record a revenue and an expense at the same time. I can't think of any other example like, like this. Received unrestricted cash gifts of $63,000, so debit cash. And this is unrestricted, so you could just go contributions without restriction, 63000 Received donated medicines and medical supplies, so that would be debit inventory. $30,000 and you credit contributions without restriction. Unrestricted fund earns investment income available for current operations. So that's $10,000 cash that you earned. And the credit would be to investment income designated for current operations. And that's general funds. Everything here is general funds. There's no donor restrictions involved. Now you sold some equipment um, costing $100,000 with accumulated depreciation of $50,000 and you sold it for $55,000. So the cash received is $55,000 and the pr credit property plant and equipment for the original cost debit accumulated depreciation for $50,000 and the gain on sale would go to gain on disposal of equipment that would be the amount of money you received $55,000 minus the book value which would be $100,000 minus 50000 
or a $5,000 gain. And you, we can eyeball it to make sure debits equal credits, $105,000. Now, we release some assets from restriction. So these are coming from the restricted fund. If you want, I can show you where they came from, but I'm going to do this in sequential order so you can see everything that's going on. So we got in the general fund. So we're just looking at this from the perspective of the general fund, and then we'll look at some of the restricted funds later on. We got 120000 from a specific purpose fund um, for education and research, 60000 um, from endowment investment, so we can't spend the endowment principal, but we can spend the income from it. We got $200,000 to buy equipment, which we're now spending, and we got $25,000 donated assets, which we're now going to place into use. And we also got pledges receivable of $12,000 that we've now collected and we can spend. So let's do the first item here. We've got this $120,000 resources used for um, education and research. And let's just assume, they don't show us where we used it, but let's assume that it was used. Um, you can't take the money unless you used it, of course. So debit cash for $120,000, credit net assets released from program use restrictions. So in essence, this is $120,000 coming out of um, your specific purpose fund with restrictions, donor restrictions, and now it's coming out of that fund and it's coming into our general fund so we can spend it. And later on you'll see it coming out of the other fund. Um, endowment from in, income from the endowment activity, let me write a little comment here just so you can keep track of everything that's going on. So resources for education and research. And I can't emphasize enough that you have to actually do education and research. Somewhere here in this huge, massive journal entry that we recorded before, where here it is. Somewhere here, we did education and research. We did what the donor wanted, so that's what entitles us to now take the money. <clears throat> also, we had income from endowment investments, so I'm gonna debit cash for that, that is $60,000. And again, the credit is going to be to net assets restrict, released from program use restrictions of $60,000. i write a little note here so you can see income from endowment investments. Here, the program use restriction was that it's income, so we can spend, then the donor specified that we can use this for operations. Resources to acquire equipment. Um, is $200,000. So again, I'm getting $200,000 over from that other fund, and I'm going to credit net assets released from equipment acquisition restriction, $200,000. And then I've got $25,000 plan expansion. These were donated assets. And again, you're going to see the other side of this property, plant, and equipment of $25,000. Credit net assets released from equipment acquisition restriction, $25,000. And donated assets placed into use. And then finally, we collect these pledges receivable. When they're receivable, they're with restrictions, with donor restrictions. Now that we get the money, the donor restriction is lifted, and that's what entitles us to take the money. So here, $12,000, I'm going to debit cash. And the credit is not to accounts receivable, because they were in accounts receivable in the restricted fund, but rather net assets released from passage of time. And you really want to go over the names of these journal entries and make sure you know them, whether it's to take my quiz or it's to take the CPA exam. The CPA exam is very, very into all of this content. I would speculate that Chapter 19 probably has the highest of percentage of the CPA exam of any chapter in this class. This maybe the SEC chapter also I think is very important. 
Um, and the other financial reporting, the segment reporting is also pretty important. So we collected receivables of, of 2250 and we wrote off bad debts of 50,000. And this is going to be standard gap. So I'm going to credit cash of 2250, debit the allowance for uncollectibles. It's not that funny business that we had with the government accounting. Um, $50,000 credit accounts receivable. And I'll just to clarify, so it's not confusing. This receivable here is not pledged donations. This is for healthcare services. Now we're going to buy some inventories at fifty thousand dollars. So debit inventory. This is like the kind of question you want on a quiz, right? Credit cash fifty thousand dollars. Sell an investment at cost of fifty thousand dollars. That makes it really easy when it's at cost. So debit cash fifty thousand dollars credit investment. How often are you going to sell an investment at cost? Right? What's the chance of that happening? Purchase equipment partially from proceeds from the above transfer um, because we have to spend the $200,000 and this would have to happen at the same time within really within the same period but you got to be very careful that you don't give the money into the general fund and then they don't spend the money. Believe it or not silly things like that do happen. I'm not speaking from personal experience. Debit property Plant and equipment, $250,000. Credit cash, $250,000. We're going to pay some liabilities now. We have notes payable to bank. I think the book gives you a trial balance before they started so you have some idea what's going on. Debit current portion of long term debt, which we're going to now pay off of $60,000. Debit accounts payable of 90,000 debit accrued expenses $25,000 credit is to cash $180,000 we see payment in advance from some of the third parties so payment in advance would be debit cash obviously but the credit would go to advances from third parties that is a liability. It should be a current liability. And then we classify the current portion of long-term debt, $50,000, debit mortgage payable, which would be long-term, and credit current portion of long-term debt, $50,000. Now, don't go away because, oh, no, there's a little more here. Record unrealized holding gain on security because your security is always kept at market value. So debit invest mints $15,000 credit unrealized holding gain on investment securities $15,000 and now in the next video don't go away we're going to look at some of the other funds with donor restrictions